Good morning ladies and gentlemen. This is week five of the introduction to culture studies and uh, today I'd like to talk with you about a specific aspect of material culture that is the clothes. Uh, clothes are everyday objects but they um, include a lot of cultural information and a lot of um, symbolism and this is something I'd like to draw your attention to today. Uh, before we do that, two terms that will be important, the diachronic analysis and the synchronic analysis. The diachronic analysis is the analysis of something like language, culture or some aspect of culture, this time it's clothes, over a period of time. So diachronic is over a period of time. Synchronic analysis, and here we have the example of uh, foods, uh, is the analysis of something, again, some aspect of culture, in different geographical locations. So for example, in different social groups, in different uh, countries, like here we have two maps showing the food of the British Isles and the food of Italy. So synchronic analysis is the same time but different place. The diachronic analysis is usually the same place but different time. And uh, this time of course we are going to talk about uh, the diachronic analysis of uh, clothes. Mostly in, in, uh, in Britain, let's say uh, more generally in the Western culture. So that's, uh, that's basically uh, the two words that I would like you to, uh, to remember. Clothing is a very important aspect of material culture because um, of its nature. Uh, it has what you might call an intimate quality. They lie next to the skin and inhabit the spaces of private life. Everybody wears clothes. Uh, they choose the clothes they like, they choose the clothes um, according to many aspects of, uh, of um, daily activities, the season of the year, the weather uh, and um, personal taste. But also clothes are the embodiment of the self, uh, of the individual identity and group identity. That is why you have here some examples like a um, designer dress from a, uh, from a um, high fashion, so this is the couture, high couture. Uh, we have casual daily clothes here worn by a man because this is not an entirely female phenomenon. Uh, although perhaps statistically more women than men are interested in the, uh, in the uh, novelties of fashion, but everybody wears clothes. And here we have the photograph of two nuns wearing two different types of habits. That is um, a specific example of what you might call professional clothes or clothes that, uh, uh, that uh, embody the position, profession, social rank of the wearer. Uh, we might want to start uh, with the beginning as uh, we did uh, um, with culture in general, so why people started wearing clothes. We have two ideas, two hypotheses here that more or less correspond to two words in the English language, clothing and costume. Clothing refers to material conditions, textile production, what fabrics were available, um, what technologies were available, let's say weaving, was it, uh, was it known, uh, what uh, um, climate was there, so uh, did the clothes need to protect the, uh, the wearer uh, from cold or maybe from too much sunlight or perhaps uh, from the rain. Uh, so this all refers to the clothing aspect of, uh, of um, garments and costume refers more to the psychological needs. 
So religious belief, the belief in magic, magical protection, uh, social position and also personal um, aspects such as personal taste and the will to please, to be, uh, to be uh, presented as, uh, as an attractive person. So um, which one was first? We do not know. Uh, archaeology uh, suggests that uh, humans started wearing some kind of clothes very early on. Uh, so definitely uh, when they migrated from Africa, they started wearing some kind of clothes for protection against the colder climate uh, in other areas of the world. But um, many cultures have some stories about how people started wearing clothes and the uh, western culture the, the european culture uh, would have this story in the bible so we have the story of adam and eve how they ate the forbidden fruit and they realized that they were naked so they started feeling ashamed of their nakedness and they took some leaves uh, from a, a nearby tree and covered their genitals, not because they were cold, but because they were ashamed for the first time of their nakedness. So they would be thinking about, uh, let's say, psychological needs rather than the, uh, the material conditions. Which one was first, we will really never know. Uh, if we think of um, uh, archaeology and uh, ethnography studying some uh, some uh, uh, let's say tribal cultures the, the cultures that haven't changed for many centuries for many millennia we have things like um, body painting really that might uh, have existed even before the um, the popularization of clothes of garments so it could be uh, used for practical reasons as a, as a kind of coverage of the body but also for psychological reasons for example as magical protection for the hunters for the warriors so uh, we have a lot of symbolic meanings embedded in clothes um, so beside this uh, body painting and adornment that could have symbolic meanings we have symbolic meaning in every kind of clothes including the clothes that you are wearing today you may want to think about the symbolic meanings embedded in the clothes that you are actually wearing now why did you choose these particular clothes because they are comfortable because um you're not going anywhere or perhaps you are going somewhere and you want to look in a particular way so uh, what these symbols could mean they could mean things like identification with heroes or totemic animals this is quite frequent in tribal societies the position of leadership to inspire fear and obedience in other members of the group so here we have this uh, photograph of an indian chief wearing uh, a very characteristic native american uh, feather headdress um, so for for the warriors this could give military advantage but also magical protection the uniforms serve a symbolic meaning of identifying who is in your group and who is the enemy uh, sometimes clothes uh, denote political convictions. In the time of the French Revolution, you may recall the term the sans culotte. In the Polish language, it's sans culotte. The culotte were types of breeches, types of legwear that were popular among the aristocracy and upper classes of the French society before the revolution. The uh, common people, the peasants and uh, our poorer sections of the society, they normally wore trousers, not the culotte. So after the French Revolution, if you continued wearing culottes rather than trousers, this might suggest that you supported the aristocracy and might even get you guillotined. In China, 
after the communist revolution. One of the things uh, that the regime of Mao did was to introduce some kind of uniformed clothes for the people. So they would, uh, they would uh, look similar. It's a very egalitarian idea to make people look similar. Um, religious beliefs can be expressed through clothes. If you think, for example, about uh, uh, Islam and the way that uh, uh, religious convictions are expressed through clothes, mostly through women's clothes. Social rank. It could be high, for example, all kinds of professional uh, uniforms of doctors and scientists and judges. Here we have a um, photograph showing English judges wearing very formalized traditional clothes with wigs. Or low social rank, like here we have a carnival version of a prison uniform. But prison uniforms were introduced to, to denote a low social rank in the prison. Also, the will to enhance bodily beauty and the will to please, but it is always influenced by the current idea of what is beautiful, what is elegant and even what is natural. So uh, we have uh, we have the development of, uh, of clothes uh, over time. So basically uh, the historians of uh, clothing um, denote three phases in the development of clothes. The first one goes from antiquity to the 14th century, so the uh, high middle ages let's say. Uh, perhaps the beginning of, of the Renaissance. There are not many changes, no national character. It's more or less similar for all social groups. It's uh, rarely tailored, usually long and draped. There would be, of course, the ways to differentiate, let's say, um, the wealth, but it would be more concerned with the quality of fabrics and, uh, uh, let's say, some accessories like jewellery or expensive uh, materials such as fur rather than, uh, than in the shape of the clothes. Then from the 14th century to the 19th century we have the second phase here identified, uh, illustrated by a, uh, by a picture showing two noble people from around the 18th century wearing, uh, as you can see, um, wigs powdered wigs and uh, very expensive clothes made of expensive fabrics, perhaps silks, with embroidery sometimes in, uh, in uh, um, gold or silver thread. There is more individual and national character. We have the beginnings of fashion, so the changes that are followed by uh, rich people basically to express their wealth. Uh, there is more concern with economy and politics and less with religion. Increasingly, um, when the Middle Ages um, finish and we have the Renaissance and then, uh, then uh, the Enlightenment, uh, religious um, beliefs are not so uh, obviously expressed by, uh, by the European clothing. It's more with economy or politics, like which social class you belong to, rather than anything else. From the 19th century until today, the clothes are less individualized because we have the mass production, so people usually buy clothes and have them made to measure. Uh, we have international fashions, globalized culture, mechanical production and uh, the European expansion mostly propagated through the colonialism. Um, so most people in the world wear clothes resembling the fashionable clothes of the Western culture. 
Uh, so as you can see, um, quite a lot uh, can happen over time. And now I would like to give you some examples. Um, it's the cat. Uh, from the 19th century, I'm mostly um, interested in my uh, research in the 19th century. So this is perhaps the most obvious thing to me uh, to give you examples from the 19th century. So let's look at two examples of uh, the clothes from the first half of the 18th century, of the 19th century, from the classicism and romanticism period. Classicism or neoclassicism. This is the uh, first style in the 19th century. This is the style of Napoleon and Jane Austen. And uh, here you have uh, an illustration from a fashion magazine um, from this period. And you can see uh, it all symbolizes the values that were most popular and highly praised in this period. Simplicity. It has this kind of heroic um, attitude associated with uh, the ancient Greece and Rome. Uh, the whole structure of the dress resembles a drapery wrapped around a column. So kind of flowing loose material following the natural shape of the body. Um, light colors, little decoration, simple hairstyles, they denote youth, health, morality and heroism, basically, symbolically. Then after the fall of Napoleon, until more, more or less the time of Queen Victoria's succession in 1837, we have the period that could be called Romanticism. And if you even look at the illustration, it denotes something completely opposite to classicism. So, imagination rather than simplicity, peacefulness rather than anything, let's say, heroic or military, individualism. There is a lot of space for individual taste, individual expression, rich colors rather than light and white um, dresses. The hourglass shape with very pronounced shoulders, waist and hips rather than this kind of flowing drapery and column-like shape. A lot of ornaments. Everything is elaborate, including the hairstyles. Just compare this very elaborate hairdo from the classical period and the romantic period. So it all denotes joyfulness, refinement. Uh, rather than, let's say, simplicity and health. It's very well expressed in fashion uh, and it very well corresponds to the political situation after the French Revolution, during the Napoleonic Wars and then after the fall of Napoleon and the triumph of the middle class in the, uh, in the 1820s and 30s. Then we have Another example of the crinoline, the quintessential high Victorian fashion. So this construction supporting the skirt, very full skirt from below. Uh, if you look at the shape of the crinoline dresses, they look like bird cages. They weren't as stiff as bird cages, of course. They look like um, some elements of, uh, of garden architecture, like the glass house structure, really. So, um, and this is the embodiment of Victorian values. Really, this is probably the most expressive Victorian style denoting Victorian values, such as traditionalism, very strictly defined gender roles. So we have this very traditional feminine shape with enlarged hips, a small waist and big skirt. But it is achieved through modern technology. Before that, in the first years of Victoria's reign, a very similar shape was fashionable, but to achieve it, a woman had to wear many layers of undergarments. Now she could reduce the number of undergarments 
by using this new invention, the metal and fabric frame to support the skirt. It was more comfortable and uh, it was probably the first fashion that was mass produced. Those crinoline cages or crinoline frames were mass produced. So this was becoming more available to the middle class and more democratic. Uh, so as you can see, especially from the historical perspective, we can see a lot of uh, symbolism, cultural symbolism and the embodiment of cultural values expressed through clothes. If you remember our initial discussion on the uh, characteristics of culture, culture is all-encompassing. So you will have the same uh, ideas expressed through painting and architecture and literature and everyday objects like clothes. And while these clothes are fashionable, uh, they are basically taken for granted. Uh, there is this idea of the transparency of fashion. So when something is fashionable, people think it reveals and strengthens the natural beauty of the wearer, which is especially visible if you look at those uh, ridiculous and exaggerated fashions from the 19th century, like the bustle style or the tournure, this is the, the synonym style of the, of the late Victorian period. So here we have an, uh, uh, an illustration from 1883 with a grown woman and a girl this is a child dressed up in a very similar uh, fashion as her mother. Probably this is a young teenager accompanying the mother on some social occasions. And what we, uh, what we can observe is the same fashion, the same shape, the same use of the artificial dress improver. So the elements of underwear that would shape the silhouette. Uh, so it was worn by everyone, including the occasions in which children were um, dressed up in more formal clothes. We can see a, a woman on the photograph, in the centre photograph, wearing a crinoline dress in 1860, although it does not really suit her figure. Uh, everybody wore the clothes when they were fashionable, so even if you were not a fashion model by your looks, you would wear these things because they were fashionable and so they were thought to be elegant, to be ladylike and to reveal natural beauty, to really, um, well, to be socially acceptable, you had to do it. So here we have a, a rather short and plump lady still wearing a crinoline that makes her look even shorter and even plumper. Uh, the last one is uh, the romantic fashion and we can see a portrait uh, of uh, a lady who's not very young but still she's wearing this very elaborate, very decorative uh, collar and cap with a lot of uh, um, ribbons and uh, frills and decorations. Um, why? Because it was believed in the 1830s that it makes her look respectable. It makes her look appropriate. So um, the last thing uh, in this part is this little graph showing the changes in male fashion because as I say, fashion is not only for women. So before the revolution and after the revolution. Before the revolution we have the traditional 18th century court dress with a wig, with uh, silk and velvet fabrics, with embroidery and lace and uh, the culottes, those uh, short knee breeches and high heels and this is all believed to make a man look more manly, to emphasize his wealth, to em emphasize his uh, sophistication and um, the fact that he is educated and cultured and that he is a nobleman. 
after the revolution the same values of being masculine, of being sophisticated and educated and cultured are expressed through completely different clothes. So no wig, you have a hat rather. Um, woolen fabrics in dark color rather than, uh, than um, embroidered silks. Uh, no accessories, very limited um, amount of accessories and jewelry. Uh, trousers and boots rather than culottes and high heel shoes. And this all is meant to express the same values, but the culture changed. So the values, let's say, of what makes a man masculine, strong and attractive are completely changed. And the last thing here is uh, um, another principle called Laver's Law. After uh, James Laver, uh, the, uh, one of the first fashion historians, uh, in his uh, very important book called Taste and Fashion, he put on this uh, table, uh, which shows the way that the same costume is treated over time. So when it is fashionable, it is considered smart, elegant. This is just the moment to wear it. Before, it is daring. A few years earlier, it is shameless. Even more, uh, before it is uh, fashionable, it is indecent. So, on first, only very brave and uh, uh, usually young and independent-minded wearers would wear it. But like 10 years before, nobody would even think of wearing something so indecent. Um, then it's fashionable and smart and elegant. And then gradually, over quite um, a short period of time, it becomes criticized. First as dowdy, so let's say um, a bit outdated. You could still wear it if you weren't uh, uh, going for a very important formal occasion, if you weren't very rich, if you weren't very young. You, you might still wear it, but if you are like at the forefront of fashion, you would not. Then 10 years after it was fashionable, it is hideous, it is horrible. This is the moment when most clothes get thrown away. That is why not many historical clothes survive. Because 10 to 15 years after they are fashionable, they are considered completely hopeless and absolutely ugly. And most women, especially rich women who can buy new clothes um, more uh, frequently, they just throw away or give away those old rags they don't want to see anymore. And then gradually the appreciation of fashion, of the same dress, uh, goes back. First it's kind of ridiculous, so you might wear it ironically. Then it's amusing, so it, as you can see it's less negative. Then it's kind of quaint, it's kind of curious and funny and uh, uh, then the next generation would find it and start wearing it as a as a kind of joke perhaps first but then it's charming and then it's romantic and even later it's beautiful again but as a kind of historical piece so um, it could be reappreciated fully as a, uh, as a thing relating to history. Let me continue in a moment.